I first saw her when I was 10 years old. It was a rainy day, and I was gunning at home on my rusty bike to escape the chilling drizzle. She was dressed in a pair of pale jeans and a dark gray coat, with her dirty blonde hair tied into a ponytail. She seemed to be in no hurry to escape the liquid assault. Her blue eyes trailed me as I neared her, and she smiled. She smiled at me as I gave a courteous good afternoon, ma'am, in passing. As soon as she nodded her head in acknowledgement of my presence, I knew I had a crush on her. My very first crush, actually. But I kept going, needing to be home by dinner. The reason for my presence in that part of town was the sudden disappearance of a friend, a 19-year-old guy named Johnny, the older brother of a friend my age named Brian, a sick boy from birth, suffering from asthma and having a weak immune system. Brian needed constant supervision. Johnny was by his side at all times, taking care of him. Needless to say, we kids were ecstatic about having a senior in our ranks. We loved Johnny. And we invited Brian everywhere with us in hopes his older brother would follow. Whenever we played games, it turned into an all-out war to decide which team Johnny would play on. Our favorite game was to play soccer. And more than once did Johnny take us all on by himself. With his lanky legs and superior speed, we'd rarely defeat him. Our last game together was soccer, actually. And Brian decided to play for the first time in a long while. He was usually relegated to either position of goalie or referee. See, we we're a hair away from scoring on Johnny, who had no goalie of his own. Another kid led the charge with me and Brian by his sides. Johnny came from behind, fast as lightning, ready to intercept the ball. I decided to slow him down. The other kid passed the ball to Brian to score. Brian caught it and advanced towards the goal while we held Johnny back. But before he could make the kick, Brian stopped dead in his tracks and grabbed his own chest. He began coughing, falling to his knees as his breathing grew heavy and his face went pale. Time out! Johnny yelled. And the urgency in his voice froze all of us. We were familiar enough with the event to know how to react, but that didn't make the panic go away. I ran to Brian to hold him up, and Johnny bolted to the sidelines. He got Brian's pack, opened it, and spilled its contents on the ground. He rifled through notebooks, water bottles, and pens until he found the inhaler. As soon as he got his hands on it, he rushed back to Brian. He pressed the inhaler on his brother's mouth, gently talking to him as Brian breathed in the puffs of medicine. After the crisis passed, he took Brian on his back. Well, boys, it looks like we'll have to cut today's game a bit short, he said with a wide smile. But let's call it a draw. We'll have a rematch the next time. We all accepted Johnny's decision. But I'll admit, I was bummed out about it. I mean, I like Brian. He was a good kid, a great friend, but I hated how he ruined our fun, and I hated myself for hating him. Still, I didn't complain. I gathered his things off the ground, stashed them haphazardly in his pack, and handed it to Johnny. We said our goodbyes, and we went our separate ways. Only later did I find out that I forgot something, perhaps the most important thing in Brian's pack his inhaler. Johnny dropped it on the ground and left it behind, only realizing his mistake when they got home. He left Brian with their parents, got on his bike, and returned to the field to get it. The last anyone saw of him was an old man that lived nearby. But Johnny... Johnny never made it back home. We found out about it the next day at school when Brian was a no-show. The police had been notified, and they did a thorough search of the area by noon. They found Johnny's bike in some bushes, and found the inhaler still in the field. There was no sign of him. No witnesses, no tracks. Not even a scent trail for the canines to follow. It was like he vanished into thin air. Rumors spread in the small town like wildfire. Anything from Johnny running away to being abducted by aliens or human traffickers. But no one knew anything for sure. The police kept trying doubling and tripling their efforts in the search area. Even my parents and older sister joined in the evenings when they got home from work. And yet, they weren't able to find a trace of him. 
Us kids would gather in the field, both to offer emotional support to Brian and hoping for Johnny to come back, or for us to find a clue the adults missed. Needless to say, we had no such luck, and after three days of being gone, everyone suspected the worst. It was early fall, and that meant rain on a semi-regular basis. It rained the evening when Johnny went missing, and it rained three days later when us kids were gathered in the field. The droplets started out small and barely noticeable, but we knew that it would turn into a downpour any moment. So we said our goodbyes to Brian, and left. On my way home is when I had my first encounter with the girl. The second encounter came a week after Johnny's disappearance, in the same feel. As dusk came, the other kids left one by one, leaving only me and Brian behind. We spent some time talking, reminiscing about his older brother, and Brian let the floodgates open for the first time. His cries carried so much anguish that I couldn't abstain anymore. My tears started flowing as well. Shed for our friend whose fate remained unknown. I don't think I felt as sad and defeated as back then in my life. Me and Brian wanted to spend a bit more time out there to let our emotions run dry, but it started raining again. I better get going, he said, rubbing tears and snot away from his sleeve. Don't need my mom to worry for me, too. Be careful, I told him. He hopped on his bicycle and took off. But I decided to stay a while longer. Rain be damned. I couldn't go back home yet. It didn't feel right. So I waited. I waited as rain fell around me in bigger and bigger droplets, facing the forest beyond the field and the town. Although we used the field to play various games, it wasn't exactly a stadium. Back in the 50s, when big swaths of trees were cleared to make room for houses, the planners overestimated their ability to sell lands to the prospect of homeowners. That left an almost perfect ring of flat land around the town, terrain ideal for us kids to play. Our field was one such place, a square of grassy terrain cut out from the surrounding forest. No lawn, no goals, no lines drawn with chalk. We brought our own cinder blocks to mark the terrain, and we gathered them in a pile when we were done playing. I sat on that pile, elbows on my knees, and my face between my palms, watching the sun setting over the forest. The rain picked up a bit, but I was too engrossed in my memories of Johnny to care. I was so out of it that I didn't notice the girl approach me from behind. She laid a hand on my shoulder giving me a good scare. Hey, she greeted, and her voice was angelic. Uh, good evening, ma'am, I answered. What are you doing out here? You'll catch a cold. Seeing the sorrowful expression I gave an answer, her smile died down. I composed myself and explained the reason for my presence in the field, feeling a knot forming in my throat as I spoke. She sat on a cinder block next to me, listening to my story and hanging on every word I spoke. Water drained her features, flowing down her hair and slicking it. Her clothes were drenched, sticking to her skin, making her look like she just came out of a swimming pool. I could barely focus on telling her Johnny's story, as my mind ran rampant with questions. Who was she? How was she so drenched when the rain was pretty tame? How have I not seen her around before? But I pushed the questions aside and finished spinning my tail, and she gave me a thoughtful nod of her head. I'm so sorry to hear that, she said, and her voice was filled with genuine empathy for my struggle. But I'm sure they'll find him soon. You should be going home. It's doing you no good being out here in the cold. With that, she got up and left. And I did the same soon after. She was right. Catching a cold would have done no one any good. I got home half an hour later, changed out of my wet clothes into clean pajamas, and went to sleep. That night I dreamt of the field, of us playing soccer on a warm, sunny day and having a great time. Johnny was there, kicking our asses as usual, 
But halfway through the match, something happened. Everyone else froze as rain began to fall around us, out of the blue. Their heads turned slowly and their eyes were filled with terror. I followed their collective gaze, scared of what I'd find, and my eyes landed on the girl. She stood ominously in the forest's edge, the finer details of her body hidden by low-hanging foliage and darkness, but I could still recognize her. She had a wide grin on her lips, and her blue eyes shined weakly in the darkness. She lifted a finger and beckoned us closer, but no one moved. No one except for Johnny, who walked towards her with hesitant steps. The girl pulled back a few steps, entering the forest, and Johnny picked up his pace. Seeing him leave us behind, memories flooded me. I remembered he went missing, that he never returned, and that he and that we didn't find a single trace of him. Certain that Johnny would die if I didn't intervene, I took off after them. The girl ran away from us, and she was nimble despite the thick forest in her path. It felt like we were chasing a mirage, a ghost that wasn't concerned with the obstacles in its path. In a matter of moments, I lost sight of her, and I could barely see Johnny's back as well. His lanky legs carried him at a pace that my stubby feet couldn't match. But I was determined not to let him and Brian down, so I powered forward. With sharp inhales that burned my lungs, I forced myself to run faster. The deeper into the forest we got, the harder the rain came down, bringing strong gusts of wind with it. The weather got so bad I couldn't see ten feet in front of myself, but I didn't lose track of Johnny. As the downpour reached a crescendo, powerful enough to nearly blow me off my feet, I caught sight of the girl. She stopped running, allowing Johnny to catch up to her. She was in the shore of a small pond with one foot in the water and one on the uncertain dirt surrounding it. Johnny neared her and she opened her arms for him, latching them around his neck. In each other's embrace, pelted by rain and ruffled by wind, they kissed. Johnny leaned into her and she pulled him in tighter, their bodies pressed against each other in the throes of passion. I didn't know what to do, what to think about the situation. So I froze. With her lips pressed on Johnny's, she looked over her shoulder at me. She was grinning. So wide it reached her eyes and arched her eyebrows. She gave me a wink. And then she jerked her whole body backwards in one swift motion, dragging Johnny along. They collapsed in the shallow water with her vanishing under the waves and pulling Johnny under as well. Taken by surprise, he screamed and struggled as he sank. But he was gone in a heartbeat. I tried to move, to rush over and help him, but my feet felt like they wouldn't budge. Try as hard as I might, I couldn't move a single muscle. Even my voice got lost in my throat as I tried to yell out. I jolted awake. Covered from head to toe in sweat. It was still dark outside, but my, my bedside clock showed that sunrise would come soon. I got dressed. I left the house post-haste, not waking anyone up to tell them I was leaving. The rain outside stopped. The only sounds in the streets were squeals of my bike as I pedaled as hard as I could. With the dream fresh in my mind, I made my way to the field. I jumped off the bike, leaving it behind as I ran into the forest. I followed the path as best I could, running even faster than I had in my dream. My guts were screaming at me, telling me how bad of an idea this was, but I couldn't stop. I had turned around a few times, the darkness of the night and the thick foliage disorienting me, but I found the clearing in a few minutes. The clouds above dispersed, allowing the moon to shine its faint light over me, and it was enough for me to see. But to this day, I wish I hadn't seen when I did. I wish I would have gotten lost, given up and returned home, but I didn't. The pond was nearly dried out, reduced to a sheen of dirty water covering the swampy mud beneath. An arm poked out of the muck, pointing up at the sky, and I saw that it was green and waterlogged. I fell backward in fear, crawling away on my elbows and screaming. Someone must have heard me because cops arrived a few minutes later, entering the forest in search of me. Hey! They yelled into the night. Is anyone there? Are you in trouble? Help! I answered. I kept shouting to guide them, seeing the beams of their flashlights approaching me. When they found me cowering at the base of a tree, all I could do was to point at the arm sticking out of the mud. Oh my god. One of them whispered, and they shined their lights on it. 
I only caught a glimpse of Johnny's swollen, rotting face, but but it was enough to leave me catatonic. Just like his arm, his cheeks puffed up as his skin and flesh absorbed water. His eyes bulged, staring at us with dried-out irises and yellowing scleras. One of the officers, a woman with kind eyes, kneeled in front of me and blocked my view. It's fine. It'll be fine, she said. But I wasn't sure if it was for me or for herself. The next few days passed in a blur, and I remember very little of them. The cops escorted me back home, and then then they brought in the forensics team to examine Johnny's death. They concluded it was an accident, that he, for whatever reason, walked into the forest and ended up falling into the pond that swelled with the river. The mud acted sort of like a quicksand, drawing him in and under the water until he drowned. Johnny's family was devastated. Everyone expected him to be dead at that point, but they... They held out hope that he might return alive. Seeing his condition, his family chose to have a closed casket funeral. One I couldn't bring myself to attend, even though Johnny was close to me and my friends. Brian took his older brother's death the hardest. He became a shut-in, skipping school more and more often and barely being mentally present when he came. We couldn't get a single word out of him most days. He stopped joining us in our outings when those resumed after a while. He fell off the social map, cut in contact with everyone and everything. At any rate, time kept passing and the mental wounds began healing, albeit slowly. Me and my friends started going out and playing again, and although it wasn't the same without Brian and Johnny, it was fun, regardless. We found a new playground on the opposite side of town, choosing to no longer use the field that had so many memories of the past. More friends came. Some old ones left with time. Normal group dynamics. It was a year until I saw the girl again. Johnny's death anniversary came up, and I decided to visit the field where we used to play in. I went by myself, on the same crappy old bike. I spent the evenings just mulling around as I remembered fond memories. Rain clouds invaded the town skies earlier in the day, blocking out the sun and threatening us with cold downpours, but I wasn't dissuaded. The clouds finally broke at sundown, sending small droplets plummeting to the ground at first, but slowly growing in intensity. I didn't see where the girl came from, but she found me on the same old pile of cinder blocks reclaimed by vegetation. Hey, it's you again, she said, making me jump to my feet with her sudden interjection. I was scared of her, thinking that she was indeed Johnny's murderer and that she was here for me now. Are you okay? She asked with a smile, stopping a small distance away. You look like you've seen a ghost or something. She chuckled, which set me somewhat at ease. I was still ready to bolt at any moment, but my tense muscles relaxed for the time being. She approached the cinder blocks and sat down, gesturing for me to do the same. I'm fine, I answered her question. Just give me a good scare, ma'am. Oh, come on, kid, she said, her smile widening. Stop calling me that. I'm not that old. Then what should I call you? I asked, hesitantly sitting down next to her. My question seemed to take her aback for a moment, and she needed to think about it for a heartbeat before she answered. You can call me Nerida, she said. It's my name, after all. And what should I call you? My name's Jameson, I answered. But all my friends call me James. Nice to meet you, James. Say, did your friend come back? Her question blew me away, leaving me speechless for a moment. I didn't know what to say, but I eventually told her about it. Not all of it. The nitty-gritty of how I found Johnny's corpse and the ripples that his death caused in our community, only leaving out the dream that I had that led me to finding him. Just like a year ago, she was very patient and compassionate towards my struggle. My worries melted away when faced with her warm presence and demeanor, and I was sure that she couldn't hurt a fly, let alone another human. Anyway, we parted ways when it started growing dark and the rain picked up. I've kept going forward. 
and I soon forgot about her again. With the passage of years and the troubles that adolescence brought, the painful memories also faded. I went to high school, finished it with decent grades, and decided to go to college to make something of my life. That meant moving away from home for the first time into a big city and a cheap, cramped apartment. I'll keep this part brief because I don't want to bore you with the details of my college life. I found part-time work at a local McDonald's. I got neck deep into student loans, and I still needed help from my parents every month to make ends meet. My father got a new job to help me out, which meant moving into a different city and leaving our town behind as well. He didn't sell our family home, though, and I'd soon be thankful for that. The COVID pandemic and the lockdowns it brought came at me in full swing during my second year. My college closed down and the classes moved online, but I decided I didn't want to do it that way. So I put college on pause, quit my job, and returned home to avoid paying any unnecessary rent. My parents were okay with it, but they stayed in the city. Their new jobs weren't affected, so they had no need to return. My dad wanted to keep sending me money and have me stay at home, and maintain the household and whatnot, but I refused. And I went job hunting in the area. I quickly found work as a night shift cashier at a local gas station just off the highway, spending my nights there and my days either playing video games or repairing stuff around the house. Most of 2020 was spent that way, and more in more or less complete isolation. Summer came and passed, with no signs of the pandemic slowing down and colleges opening back up, so I decided to wait another year. As autumn came, I received some terrible news, though, through the grapevine of gossip. As I've said before, I fell out of contact with Brian after Johnny's death. He went through his rebellious phase during his teenage years, starting to abuse soft drugs like alcohol, cigarettes, weed. In time, he moved to harder stuff. Stealing and selling things from his home to fuel his mountaining addictions. In the early fall of 2020, as his parents couldn't take it anymore, they were going to kick him out. He, um, he overdosed on something. No one knew if he'd done it on purpose or on accident. But it didn't matter. His parents were decimated regardless. They just lost their second child. I wasn't invited to the funeral, partly because of the COVID restrictions, but partly because people knew that me and Brian hadn't been friends in a long while. But even so, a few days after he was buried, I visited his grave. I paid my respects. Brian had been buried next to his brother, and Johnny could finally look after him again. I said a short prayer on the flowers on their graves, and I went to that field that we used to play in, in what felt like a lifetime ago. The place was overgrown with tall grass and wild weeds far cry from the mowed lawns that we had maintained to facilitate our games. I got out of my car, noticing a small memorial way off in the sea of grass, right on the border of the forest. I didn't need to get closer to figure out what it was, but I did, regardless. It was a stone cross mounted on a cement pedestal, with burnt-out candles, flowers, and a picture of Johnny at its base. Brian probably made it and brought it here, because it looked homemade rather than commissioned. I think I stared at that picture of Johnny for half an hour at the very least because I I clearly remembered the day when it was taken. We pulled our allowance together, worked odd jobs around town all summer long and got enough money to visit a nearby amusement park and ride all the rides multiple times. Johnny took us there and accompanied us since he was the only one among us who was old enough to drive. Someone was there with an old-timey camera taking pictures of folks for a small fee, so we got a group one. Brian had edited the rest of us out, leaving only his brother, his older brother, who was smiling from ear to ear. Wrapped up in these memories, I failed to notice that it started to rain. No. Smiled from ear to ear. Wrapped up in these memories, I failed to notice that it started to rain. The small drops fell out of the sky here and there, hitting my exposed skin and sending chills rippling through my body. 
so I turned to walk back to the car and return home. Narada was by the car, propped against the passenger side door and waiting for me. She smiled when I noticed her, and waved a hand through the air to make me hurry up. By that time, I hadn't seen her in the better part of a decade. She didn't look like she'd aged a single day. Even her clothes were the exact same. James, she said when I got closer. I haven't seen you in so long. My eye, you grown. Hey, Narada, I greeted. What's up? Oh, just the usual, she said, as if I was supposed to know what her usual was. How about you? Same, I answered. I went off to college, but the pandemic forced me to come back home. We talked for a long while, though I did most of the talking and she did most of the listening. But the rain started to get on my nerves, so I invited her over for a coffee at my place instead, where we could talk in peace while we warmed up. No. She flat out refused. I can't come. Oh yeah, pandemic and all that, I said, rubbing the back of my head in embarrassment. I still had not gotten used to it. No, no, Nerida said reassuringly. I'd love to come over, but I literally can't. This was the last straw. Breaking the metaphorical back of the camel. My curiosity about her reached unprecedented levels, and I couldn't hold back my questions anymore. Why so? I asked. And I have more questions, if you don't mind. Nerida sighed deeply, but my outburst didn't seem to surprise her. She seemed to have expected it, actually. I don't mind. Go ahead and ask. How come I only see you when it's raining? Why are you always dripping wet, even when the rain is mild? How come... She raised a hand to stop me. So I did. Fearing that I'd offended her. But that didn't seem to be the case. We spent a few moments in silence while she searched for her words. But she did answer me. You're kind. She said hesitantly. Humans. You have many names for us. Naiads. Water nymphs. Elemental spirits. All sort of true, but not quite accurate. I'm... I'm not like you. I'm not a human. As if to prove her claims, she raised a hand in front of her face. Water dripped down her arm from the tips of her fingers, faster and faster until it formed an impossible torrent. Too much water to come from a few droplets of rain. The ones that hit us now and again... I'm bound to the rain, she continued after a long pause. To it, and to the bodies of water it creates. When those vanish, I have to retreat into the underground aquifer to survive. I'll dry up in the sun in no time. I... I didn't know what to think, what to say. I... I did believe her, but how how do you answer to a confession like that? That, uh, that, that's neat, I said eventually. It's a sad and boring existence, she said. I'm always alone. This is the closest I can get to your town. You're such interesting being. I love to learn more about you all, but unfortunately, I can't. We spent a bit more time talking, and this time she let the floodgates open. She told me about her millennia-old life, of her time skipping between rivers and lakes in Europe when she was born, and of how she made it to the Americas with the first colonists. I can't actually enter salt water, only fresh water, she explained. But just as your kind has its brave explorers and settlers, so do ours. We made deals with sailors to bring us over in barrels of fresh water, offering their colonies consistent rain for their crops when we'd arrive. Nerida said that her and other naiads came over to the Americas with their first settlers, living in their wells or in rivers close to their budding towns. Just like they'd promised back in Europe, the naiads provided the settlers with regular rain, and in exchange, they were revered as deities. But that didn't last long. After the first few generations of humans, only the elders were left who knew about the Naiads and their deal with them. As younger generations returned to Christianity and other religions, the Naiads were all but forgotten. 
Soon after the last humans who had known about us died, we abandoned their settlements, Merida said. Some of us still stayed behind, kept their part of the deal, but they perished long ago. And now you're stranded here? All alone? I asked, which caused Merida to wince. Basically. Most other naiads either died or returned to Europe. There are very few of us left. I haven't met any of my kind in almost a century. How about this? I offered, trying to lift her spirits. Whenever it rains, I'll come visit you here if I can. Narita's move flipped almost instantly, and she gave me a wide, grateful smile that melted my heart. I left that evening, but true to my word, the next day it rained, I returned. This time, I was better prepared with a raincoat, boots, thick clothes to shield me from the cold, and most importantly, a movie that I downloaded to my phone for us to watch. If Nerida couldn't come closer to us and experience human culture, I could bring it closer to her. I found her on the pile of cinder blocks waiting for me to arrive. I pulled out my phone, which I kept in a Ziploc bag to protect it from water damage, and after I explained what it was to Nerida, I got the movie playing. We watched many more of those in the meantime, so I can't remember them all, but I know the first movie we ever watched was The Titanic. A sappy choice for her first movie. I know, but I figured that she'd like it since it, it had a bit of everything. And well, to say she liked it would be an understatement. She loved it. She was infatuated with it. Her eyes were glued to the phone screen the entire time, and I couldn't get a single word out of her. When the movie was finally done, she turned to me and punched my shoulder lightly. Trying to tell me something with that? She asked with a giggle. Yeah, I said with a grin of my own. And I don't much like horror or sci-fi. I'm a sucker for sappy movies. Sci-fi? She asked with intrigue. What's that? She then proceeded to ask me more questions than I've been asked in my entire life. But I answered them all with the best of my abilities. The entire fall season of 2020 was spent basically like that. With me going out to the field whenever it rained so I could spend time with her. I showed her music, art, books, comics, anime, manga, anything and everything we had to offer for entertainment. She lapped it all up. She did much better with written stuff than visual media. She... She rifled through a digital copy of 2001 A Space Odyssey in minutes, explaining that her mind could run at much higher speeds than ours if she chose. During this time, my crush on her only grew stronger and stronger. Even though I didn't think much about her before, when I was a teen and all that, the, the feelings instilled into me when I first saw her they never really went away. And now they returned in full swing, deepening with every moment we spent together. She was just amazing. Overall, I, I couldn't get enough of her. Needless to say, as fall turned to winter and the rains gave way to snow, I was devastated. I was hoping that since snow was technically frozen water, she could still come out, but she didn't. And the winter of 2020 was the loneliest, the most boring one of my life. Each day was torture. I merely went through the motions of going to work, showering, eating, and generally staying alive. The only thing that powered me was the prospect of spring, of the snow melting and the rains returning, bringing Nerida back to me. The months rolled by me slowly, but soon enough, 2020 came to pass. January of this year also came and went, and to my delight, the snow started melting recently. In fact, just a week ago, we got the first rain of the year. It was cold as balls, and I knew it could turn to snow or sleet at any moment's notice, so I didn't lose any time. I got dressed, I left the house in a hurry, jumping into my car and speeding off towards the field. My hope was that I could somehow convince Nerida to come live with me, at least until it got warmer outside. I didn't know exactly how we could accomplish that, but she said that she rode across the Atlantic in a barrel of fresh water, so it was definitely doable. I reached the field before I reached a solution for my dilemma. But I hoped that she could help me out, and our two heads combined would be better than one. My heart took a heavy blow when I didn't find her there, waiting like she usually did. Was it still too early for her to come out? I mean, when would I see her again? Would I ever? 
She said that her kind could still die, so what, what if she died in the meantime? My mind ran wild with questions, and when I couldn't take the burden of not knowing the answer any longer, I started shouting, Nerida! Who are you? I left the sidewalk as I yelled, stepping out into the muddy grass and approaching the field. Hey, are you okay? Please! It was nearing evening, but it wasn't dark out yet. The sky was tinted in the signature red glow of sunset, now blocked by heavy gray clouds. My screaming attracted the attention of the neighbors. I realized as much when I saw ports lights come on, but I didn't care. I kept at it, turning in the fields like a madman screaming at the top of my lungs. I saw an old man leave his house and either offer to help me or tell me to zip it, but he got to do neither because I caught sign of something in the woods. Narrowed a shape was in there, masked by the dark shadows of the trees watching me. She reclined against a trunk, seeming weaker and frailer than I remember. Her eyes shined faintly, but barely above a wisp of light. Something wasn't right with her, and that made me worry more. She lifted an arm and gestured for me to go to her. Figuring that she didn't want to be seen by others, I obliged and took off running through the mud. Now I, I know what I did was stupid, and that every decision I made afterward was a bad one. I know it, and I regret it. I regret not stopping to think it through, but you know what they say, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. In the heat of the moment, worried for my friend and crush, I didn't think straight. I ran into the forest after her, but Nerida, Nerida ran away from me. I yelled for her to stop, that it was me, and that I would help her if she wasn't well. But she didn't listen. The winds and the rain picked up, and deeper into the forest I followed her until I couldn't feel my hands and feet from the intense cold. But I trudged on, even when my visibility dropped to my immediate surroundings and I had to slow down to a crawl, I kept walking, screaming out her name. I lost sight of her in the sudden storm, but I, I hoped that she would come back to me, and she did. She came at me from behind, fast and vicious, picking me up and pinning me against a tree. The fast movements and the sudden impact almost left me breathless, and I struggled to look at her through the water that dripped down my face. She looked sick, malnourished. Weaker than I'd ever seen her before, her skin was cold as ice. She was she was never warm to the touch. Her body had always matched the ambient temperature. And that held true in the moment as well. She snuggled up against me, trying to get her body as close to mine as possible, in what I assumed was an attempt to warm up. Tears started rolling down her face, clearly visible, even through the downpour of water that covered her body. She buried her face in my chest, hugging me so tight that I... I had trouble breathing as she sobbed. I missed you, she said, her voice crisp and audible despite the storm raging all around us. This winter was so cold, the coldest one in my life. Dick move on my part, I know, but I decided that this was the perfect moment for me to profess my feelings for her. I freed one of my arms, I cupped her chin, and brought her eyes up to meet mine. Merida, I... I started, but she cut me off. I know, she admitted. I always did, and I'm sorry, she said, her sobbing growing louder. For a moment, I feared that she didn't reciprocate my feelings, that my confession would drive her away, and that I'd never see her again. For the first time in centuries, I'm so, so sorry. I tried to abstain. I tried to take as little as I can to survive, but I can't help myself anymore. I didn't get to ask her what any of that meant. Before I knew it, she shot up on her toes and pressed her cold lips against mine. My mind ran rampant with a whirlwind of emotions that put the outside winds to shame. This was all I'd ever wanted and then some. I hugged her tighter, lifting her off her feet in the process, and the heat of passion overtook me. I ended up tripping in the mud, falling on my back, and bringing her down with me, but she didn't seem to mind. Our lips never parted, and her pursuit for me was wild. I only figured out that something was wrong when I realized that I needed air. That that I hadn't taken a breath in a hot minute and I'd soon suffocate. Narrowed a skin turned into a raging torrent that blocked my nose, and she kept my mouth too preoccupied with hers to allow air in. I, I placed a hand on her chest to gently push her away and take a desperate inhale, but my palm sank. Her flesh gave way around my fingers, turning into water and allowing them to pass through her being. My nerves fired instantly. 
sending bolts of pain rippling through my body. It felt as if I plunged my hand into a vat of acid, as if my flesh was breaking down fast, leaving only bones and agony behind. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. I snuck a foot between us and tried to push her away with it, but it met the same fate as my hand. It sunk into her up to the knee, and I, I, I felt it erupt with just as much pain. I was scared. Either my struggle would completely dissolve me, or Nerida would suffocate me. When even her tongue turned to water, filling my mouth and throat as it flowed endlessly out of her, my fear turned to sheer terror. She would drown me. As I felt my tongue being seared with pain as well, all fight left me and I resigned myself to my fate. There was no escape for me. I was a goner and my only hope was that there would be anything left of me for the authorities to find. A moment after that, Oxygen deprivation finally caught up to me, and I fell unconscious, with Nerida still straddling me. I woke up a few days later in the hospital, missing an arm up to the elbow, a leg up to the knee, and my tongue in its entirety. A cop visited me soon after to take my statement, and shed light on my unexpected survival. As it turns out, the old man that left his home as I yelled like a crazy person called the cops when he saw me run off into the woods. This being a small town with not much of anything going on, a patrol car was able to answer right away. They found me passed out in the woods a few minutes later, with parts of my body waterlogged as if they'd been submerged for days or even weeks. Flesh was completely ruined, the cop told me. But for Christ's sake, son, your arm fell off when I picked you up. The doctors had one hell of a job ahead of them when I brought you in. And that was true. The doctors and nurses were in for the case of their lives, as were the local police. They amputated whatever couldn't be saved and worked around the clock to keep me from dying of infection and dehydration and whatnot. But they pulled it off. Seeing as I couldn't speak without my tongue, and I lost my dominant hand, the police was kind enough to go to my house and fetch a laptop for me. Another guy, his name's Gus. Great dude, so I trusted him with the keys to the front door, and he did me this favor. With my laptop at hand and a notepad open, I started answering the questions one by one, but I wasn't truthful with him, of course. I knew I'd come off completely crazy if I told him anything. Instead, I said that I probably had a mental breakdown from being isolated for so long, I went off the deep end. I told him I didn't remember what happened to me, how I sustained so much water damage in a matter of minutes, as I passed out soon after I entered the forest. That was pretty strange indeed, Gus said when I was done. I'll send this info up the chain. Maybe someone knows an explanation or something. Soon after that, he bid me a fast and easy recovery and left. I appreciated his intention, but I wasn't a fool. There'd be no way for me to recover and get well. My life was destroyed. I'd never be the same. That was yesterday. I got the password to the hospital's Wi-Fi this morning. I researched a bit more about naiads. I found out a lot of lore and plenty of accounts about them, but they are all pretty much contradicting each other, so I, I don't know what to think anymore. The only thing I'm sure of is that Nerida wanted to consume me to sustain herself. That she was, she was the one who killed Johnny all those years ago for the same reason. She got scared away when the cops arrived. That old man is likely the only reason why she spared me. That brings me to the present. Why I decided to write this out while I still can. As evening came and gray clouds rolled into the skies above from the horizon, they brought more rain. My bed is right by the window, and I could see Nerida out there pacing about waiting to finish what she started. She smiled up at me when she noticed me staring through the window. She gestured for me to come outside. I can't tell you how much I've been fighting the urge to oblige. But for how long I'll manage to retain my, my self-control and my sanity. So I'm writing and posting this as a warning to everyone. Fear the Nyads. Avoid them at all costs. 
stay inside when it rains. Don't make the same mistake as Johnny and me. Good evening, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. If you guys are looking for a nice hot beverage to enjoy while listening to scary stories, or if it's still snowing out where you guys are, because I keep seeing that everywhere, then might I suggest you check out etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. It's my wife's tea shop. She has numerous different teas that you can be able to get, as well as Dungeons and Dragons and creepy pasta themed teas. And if you ask for the Mr. Creepy Pasta dabbing sticker, if you get a Mr. Creepy Pasta Dark and Stormy Night tea, then you get the special little sticker that I threw together. And of course, I want to give a very, very, very big shout out to all of my followers on Patreon, especially Bloodlace, Peter Bowie, Acid System, F, Alan Hyper, Brennan Matthews, Mary Massacre, Janine Hook, Paul Livingston, Seth Joseph Richards, Ashlyn, Did I Knit, Azad Hosenbuckus, Rick Dance, Bryce Charles, Luminan Walker, Sherry Morgan, Jake McNee, Victoria Helton, BDH9294, Melinda S, Finney, Nathan, Dante Rao, Jane Reynolds, Ace Band G, Ryan Kellum, Bobby J. Cavanaugh, Barbara Biggs, Bella Bailey, Ninja Grace, Dead Obsessed Trash, Suzanne Groh, Tommy Walters, Tater Chip, Onbu Op Willie, Sarah Gree, Yuri Katzlash, Randy, Brad Gustafson, Sean Tristan Markham, B. Lisa Tyser, Jose Rodriguez, Adagio Rose, Peaceful Buddha, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Ho Gunkchi, Justin Johnson, King Hades F13, Michael Scarborough, James Lowe, Someone You Love, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, and Chance Burnett. You guys, as always, are the real MVP, and I can't thank you enough for helping me get to where I am now and, you know, generally keeping me alive. So, thank you all so much. For supporting on Patreon, thank you everybody in the description for supporting on Patreon, and thank you everybody out there who's listening and watching somewhere across the many reaches of the internet. Have a good night, and sweet dreams.